I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, a woman is mauled to death by two dogs, and the owners are charged in her death. But was it murder? Welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my very best friend in the world, Alice. Brett, don't make me cry. You're my very best friend. (laughs) Well, it's true, Alice. It is true, and I love you very much, and your family is my family and always will be, and I just want you to know that, and I want all the listeners to know how amazing and wonderful you are. Stop it. You're going to make me cry. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, we'll update you on some personal stuff later on after you get your true crime. But especially our patrons, y'all have been so patient and waiting for new content. And I just have to say, Brett has been in and out of the hospital for his sweet baby boy. And you know what? His baby boy's still there. But he said, I'm home right now. Can we please record something for our amazing fans? Guys, if that's not commitment, I don't know what is. And I met so many of you guys at CrimeCon this past weekend. And you guys have just filled my heart. And you filled Brett's heart too. Because a lot of you were part of video messages sent to him. So... We will not spend too much time right now, but just know we love each other and we love you guys. We do. And we will, like Alice said, I'll give you an update on how everything's going at the end of the show. But for those of you who are just here for the true crime, we will go ahead and dive in. And today we are talking about the case of Diane Whipple. This case was suggested to us by someone on Twitter. Thank you to them. I hope you enjoy our coverage of this story. And this is this is a crazy one. When I when I Googled this one, I thought this is a case we need to cover because not only is it interesting factually, but there's a lot of interesting legal things that happen that I think you guys will enjoy. If you do enjoy this podcast and you want to read more about this, there are some really good resources out there. Rolling Stone has an excellent article on this case. And 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 this one's kind of weird, but there's a lawyer named Kenneth Phillips, whose expertise, according to his website, is dog bite law. And he has a whole write-up on this case. And it's actually really good. And he has a lot of resources on there. So, you know, if you need a lawyer in a dog bite case, he's, I guess, a good one. But you also can read about this case. And we'll put those on the website and in the show notes so you can check that out. But as I said, today we're going to talk about the case of Diane Whipple. And on January 26, 2001, Diane was living a good life in San Francisco with her partner of six years, Sharon Smith. She turned 33 only a few days before, and she was the lacrosse coach at St. Mary's College of California. And she had, she had definitely earned that job. She was an amazing athlete with an amazing history. She had been a world-class athlete, a high school All-American and an All-American at Penn State in lacrosse. But she was such a fantastic athlete that her abilities actually transcended sports. She came within two seconds of making the 1996 Olympic team in the 800 meters, which is incredible and incredible for someone who wasn't even a runner as her main sport. And having reached that peak, she decided to move on to coaching and helping the next generation to achieve the kind of athletic heights she had reached. Now on that same day, January 26, 2001, Paul 
Kornfed Schneider, a high-ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood, which is a notorious racist gang that espouses a belief that Hitler had the right idea, was sitting in a California prison. He'd be there for a while, having been sentenced to two life sentences for a major drug smuggling operation and violent armed robbery. He'd later be sentenced to even more time for his involvement in some murders, in case that wasn't enough, and would also draw the ire of the Brotherhood itself, who would put out a contract on his head. You might wonder how these two people have anything in common. And the answer is nothing, were it not for Paul Schneider's acquaintances, the husband and wife team of Marjorie Fran Noller and Robert Edward Noel. These two lawyers got to know Schneider through their work representing prison guards who faced retaliation for reporting abuses in the prison system. Although, thought by some to be rather mediocre at their jobs, Noller and Noel had earned respect around San Francisco for their pro bono and charitable work. One of their cases involved a prison guard who had some involvement in a scheme by the Aryan Brotherhood to murder sex offenders in the prison, something they are particularly famous for. This case brought them into contact with Paul Schneider, who they became friendly with. So, so friendly that they would eventually adopt Paul Schneider. Which is totally weird. <laughs> what? Can you even adopt an adult? Like legally? I guess you can because they do adopt him. And I don't know. I was reading about this and it was sort of an interesting thing. Apparently you can adopt adults. And typically the reason you do it is so that you have certain legal rights vis-a-vis -vis that person. Apparently, and and people can correct me if, if this is not true, but I read about this as I was learning about Paul Schneider. Before gay marriage and before domestic partnerships and that kind of thing, this was fairly common in the gay community to adopt. Someone would adopt the other one so that they would have some sort of legal rights to each other, you know, like all the things you think about when you think about a married couple and like hospital visitation or rights about medical care, like all that kind of stuff, financial things. So apparently this is something you can do. And it is something that that these two lawyers did vis-a-vis -vis Paul Schneider. I also didn't know the Aryan Brotherhood was killing sex offenders. I didn't know they did that I either. I did not know that. And Paul Schneider was considered the most dangerous man in California at one point. And he was... You know, this is a, a dangerous guy. He, at one point, attacked his lawyer. I was reading about this. It was uh, He had a court-appointed lawyer for some minor hearing, and he stabbed him in the neck. And the reason he did that was not because the lawyer had done anything and he was mad at the lawyer. It was to show the warden and the marshals that he could get to people at any time. So, you know, they had searched him obviously, for weapons, but he had managed to to secret one in to the courtroom and stab his own lawyer. So that's the kind of person that we're dealing with here. That's terrifying, and I'm not going to lie. The thought has crossed my mind before, Brett, when I'm in court. I'm like, am I about to be stabbed in the neck? <laughs> and yeah, now I realize exactly. it's probably from hearing about this instance. It very well could have been, because this that incident did make a lot of no, a lot of uh, news. One funny thing, and this is the kind of thing that could only happen in California. So he stabs the guy in the neck. And then from that point on, they do very invasive searches of him every time he goes anywhere. And he sues and wins his lawsuit on the Even basis that <laughs> they had violated his rights. And it's like, the dude stabbed somebody in the neck. Oh, my you know? goodness. Well, you know. He should be searched thoroughly all, at all times. Can I also but. say, though, that that is a very good a very good instance of how we really do have protections in this country, uh, civil rights protections that basically outstrip just about any country in the world. So, I mean, I'm not saying there are not abuses, but, like, the fact that a guy can stab his attorney in the neck to make a point and it's not directed at that attorney's per se and still win that civil rights lawsuit is pretty, you know, says something about protections provided here. There you go. That's a nice that's a nice spin on it, Alice. That's 
No, I really I was thinking about it, but that that's a good way to look at it. So just, we're going to go with that. <laughs> just trying to show this people that there are there are different country. sides of the story. Flags are waving. <laughs> <laughs> The national anthem is playing over here. Oh, anyway, gosh. yes. So even Paul Schneider has rights despite his actions. And Schneider, you know, he's not just a murderous criminal, armed robber, lawyer, stabber, uh, and everything else. He also is a businessman. And he had uh, a business idea for the Aryan Brotherhood. He decided he was going to run a breeding operation, a dog breeding operation for the Aryan Brotherhood that he called Dogs of War, because what else would you call it, right? And these war dogs that he selected were Prese Carnario dogs, which if you haven't seen these dogs, we're going to put a picture of one of them on the website. Brett, I mean, they are, I actually um, have come in contact with these types of dogs before. They're beautiful creatures that are terrifying. They look like the dog in Harry Potter. Do you know what I'm talking about? In yes, one of the Harry Potters, yes. there's like the dog that has multiple heads, I think. I mean, mm. and it's like all pure muscle. That's what this dog look, looks like. Yeah. I mean, they are huge dogs and they were bred to basically wrangle bulls on the Canary Islands. So you think about a dog that can take down a bull, that's a pretty big deal. And those of you who know what a pit bull looks like just imagine a pit bull and multiply it by two and that's what you have here i mean these just huge dogs war dogs is actually pretty appropriate i mean they are these are dogs that are bred from the old you know war dogs of the roman legions i mean these are like huge huge animals and you know we are no we do not discriminate against dogs here on the prosecutors podcast we know there are a lot of people who don't like pit bulls in some places they're even illegal these dogs, you know, they can be very vicious dogs if raised by the wrong people. But, you know, in a loving family with people who know how to handle them, they can be perfectly fine. Well, obviously, Snyder and his Aryan Brotherhood dog raising scheme was not looking to raise dogs that you would want to have in your home. In fact, he wanted to breed dogs that would be perfect for defending the assets of the Aryan brotherhood their meth labs and and things like that and defend them violently and you know not 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 leaving anybody behind if this dog gets after you it's not gonna it's not just gonna like nip at you it's gonna rip your throat out schneider would later fancy himself an artist and he would paint pictures of himself and his beloved dogs who he named bane and hera and he would also paint pictures of his adopted parents, who we mentioned before, Marjorie and Robert. These rudimentary paintings would eventually become prized possessions for these two lawyers. Now, this all seems very strange, right? We've already talked about how weird it is that they adopted him. And if that were all, that would be enough. But it doesn't actually stop there. The relationship between... Schneider and these two people was strange to say the least. According to the Rolling Stone article that we mentioned earlier that was written on this case, the Schneider and his his adopted parents would often exchange pornographic letters. And rumors were rampant that those letters included pictures of Marjorie engaged in sexual acts with the dogs. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is an example of the kind of salacious falsehoods that often follow high-profile cases. That's certainly what I thought when I first read it. But there was a search warrant the police served on the couple after the incident we're going to talk about for photographs of, quote, sexual acts that involved dogs. And that makes you wonder just how much probable cause they had to believe these photographs existed and it didn't help that Marjorie would often refer to Bain as her, quote, certified lick therapist. Marjorie would later say of, of the pornographic letters that this was something that, that she had been told people who were spending the rest of their life in prison needed that would be helpful for them. And so this was something she was doing to help out Schneider. So, okay, you know, <laughs> I, guess that's, I guess that's love, sending pornographic letters to your adopted son. But in any event, strange relationship from the very beginning. 
Brett, before we move on, I have to say, when the weather gets warmer, the last thing I want to do is be all sweaty in my kitchen cooking over a flaming hot stove. No, thank you. But also, I don't exactly want to order takeout for every meal. That's why I'm obsessed with Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbread, smoothies, and more, all built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It takes literally minutes to prepare, and I love knowing that the food I'm eating is actually good for me. And Alice, you know, and anybody who knows me knows, that I love ice cream. And that's why my personal favorite for this summer is Daily Harvest Scoops. Their plant-based ice cream, Scoops, is the perfect sweet treat. Plus, it's gluten and dairy-free. And Daily Harvest is all about leaving the earth in a better place than they found it. Not just for us, but for future generations to come. They focus on increasing biodiversity, investing in organic farming practices, reducing food waste, and even prioritizing recyclable and compostable packaging. Mm, Brett, you are making me hungry from some mango papaya smoothie or their chocolate and ooey gooey midnight fudge scoops. Ooh. So you guys can join us. Stay cool, calm, and collected during the summer heat. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter code OWLS to get $25 off your first box. That's code OWLS for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. That's dailyharvest.com. Dot com. We haven't even gotten to kind of the the crime part so far. I mean, this is already stranger than fiction, Brett. And now let's, <laughs> now let's talk about these dogs. These dogs were an absolute terror. They turned this quiet apartment building in which Diane lived into a place of fear and danger. Bane and Hera attacked at least three other dogs, nearly killing a German shepherd. The dogs often escaped their owners who could not control them. And that's kind of the point, right? If you're breeding them to be these dangerous animals, part of the danger is that just about no one can control them, including the owners. I mean, these dogs were bigger than their owners. I mean, they were, you know, there's, unless they just obeyed them out of respect, they were never going to control them physically. No, so I mean, so I had a um, German Shepherd who was about 80 pounds, so a fraction of, you know, the size of Bane and Hera. And, you know, my German Shepherd was pretty well trained, but once in a while there'd be a squirrel that darted across the street. And the best thing I could do was just drop the leash because otherwise I would be dragged into the middle of traffic. And we're talking about just an 80 pound German Shepherd. And here, these two dogs nearly killed a German Shepherd, just to give you an idea of their strength and their their kind of power. And I think most of you out there, you may have never seen one of these dogs before out in the wild or out in the world, but you probably do know about German Shepherds. And German Shepherds, I mean, these are police dogs. I mean, these are dogs that are that are, you know, can be very scary in of themselves. They can also be the sweetest dogs in the world. When I was a kid, I was actually attacked by a German Shepherd who tried to kill me. Oh, my and my gosh. Uh, neighbor, yeah, my mom was, like, carrying me across the street, and this German Shepherd attacked us. And the German Shepherd was trying to get me, and she was trying to hold me up above, you know, where it could reach. And then the neighbor came over with a shovel and, like, whacked it and ran away. So I remember that's like one of my first memories. So that's in any event, terrifying. German Shepherds. Yeah. I mean, German Shepherds, you know, they can be pretty intimidating dogs. And these dogs, you know, just dominated them. And let's be clear. German Shepherds and Presa Canaries are not in and of themselves vicious, you know, uncontrollable dogs. But they were bred for certain purposes that involved a lot of strength and a lot of power. And as all kind of if you're if you're breeding a war dog, you do certain things to make them want to attack. So some of you may even have a price of canary. You know, God bless you for feeding them because I, I've I met someone who told me how much they spent weekly on their price of canaries um, food bill, and it was just shocking. <laughs> much more than really feeding my entire family for a week. Let's put it that way. And so it's not that they, uh, you know, all price of canaries or all German shepherds are going to attack, but they they were bred for a purpose. And then if you exploit that purpose, which has been happened here, they become this weapon. And that's exactly what Bane and Hera were. They were weapons. 
it wasn't just dogs that they had attacked. More than once, they cornered residents and stared them down with a ferocity that anyone who experienced it would never forget. On their hind legs, they stood as tall as any person. I think they actually would be taller than I am. Now, testimony would later detail that the dogs had bit several people. Exactly what happened that day we'll never know as Marjorie was the only witness and her story smacks of self-serving lies at parts. We know that Diane was returning home after buying some groceries. As she tried to enter her apartment, Marjorie came down the hall with her dog, Bane. It's difficult to overstate how massive Bane was. Three feet tall at his shoulder, 120 pounds of pure muscle. Marjorie would later say that Diane stared at Bane, refusing to enter her apartment even when it became obvious Bane was upset. She'd also say that Hera came to the door and growled at Diane, triggering Bane's protectiveness. Now another witness would later state that Marjorie told her a different story, that she'd been in an argument with Diane about the dogs before they attacked her. We describe the situation because just think about the the story that Marjorie is painting, at least in this version, not the contradictory version, that Diane, just grocery shopping, probably holding groceries that need to be put in the fridge, is staring down some 120-pound dog that could, looks like, and could, in fact, you know, rip her throat out instead of just open the door and walk into her own apartment. Which is crazy. I mean. I can't. I don't stare down any dog. (laughs) No. No, particularly a dog like this. And other people would later testify at the trial that's going to happen that Diane was terrified of these dogs for good reason and that the dogs had had cornered her before. Um, and it just it is nonsensical that Diane is challenging these dogs in the hallway. But for whatever whatever the reason, whatever it is, when Bane saw Diane He lunged at her to attack and easily escaped Marjorie, who who could not control him, even when he wasn't in attack mode, but certainly not uh, in a situation like this. Marjorie would later state that as the dog was attacking Diane, she told her to stay still. Quote, I told her to stay still. If she had, this would have never happened. Which, okay, so (laughs) the dog is attacking her viciously and she's she's just supposed to to stay still that's what she's supposed to do even if that was good advice it's not the kind of advice that any any person is going to be able to follow and not surprisingly diane did not stay still as the dog was attacking her over this attack which lasted 20 minutes oh my goodness the dog mauled diane horribly she had nearly 80 distinct injuries on her body. According to the autopsy, the attack injured Diane from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. When EMTs arrived, they simply did not know what to do. Diane's injuries were so severe. Although Diane was still alive and conscious, which is honestly terrible to think about. I wish she'd been unconscious. Her larynx had been crushed and she lost at least a third of her blood. And given the damage to her body, it's likely that no matter how well-trained these EMTs were in dealing with this kind of attack, that there was nothing they could have done to save her. Marjorie would later say that Hera did not engage in the attack, but the blood on Hera's coat and what appeared to be shreds of Diane's clothes and her fecal matter told a different story. And Diane's clothes were absolutely shredded. When paramedics arrived, she was nude, save for a single sock. Now, hearing this devastating scene, you can imagine blood covered the hallway of the apartment building. Marjorie locked the dogs inside her apartment, but she did not, however, call 911. That was left to a next-door neighbor. When animal control arrived, they carefully entered the apartment. 
and when they found Bane lurking in a bathroom, they fired a tranquilizer dart into him that was designed to bring down a dog of his size. But it had no effect. They fired two more darts into him, but still nothing happened. I mean, this is telling you how powerful and muscular these dogs are, that Bane is. They, you know, they measure these darts to be able to take down Think about like elephant tranquilizers to take down the dog of his size, but they fired three of them, three times the amount that was supposed to take him down and nothing happened. Now, eventually they were able to subdue him with two animal control poles wrapped around his neck and they wasted no time pumping the dog full of sodium pentobarbital, finally killing Bane. And Hera, the other dog in the apartment, would also be euthanized. Now, although initially classified as an accident, it wasn't long before charges were brought against both Noel and Noller. Yeah, and so that's that's the story of what happened here. Terrible, terrible story about what happened to Diane. And you could imagine circumstances in which something like this happened and there were no criminal charges brought. You know, lots of us own dogs. And you could imagine a situation in which, for whatever reason, you lost control of your dog or your dog snapped back into its, you know, natural state and attacked somebody and even killed them. And maybe you would consider it to be an accident. But that's not how this was treated. In this case, there were criminal charges brought against these two individuals and and not just any charges, serious charges charges. Noel, who wasn't there when all this occurred, was charged with involuntary manslaughter. Noller was charged with involuntary manslaughter and second degree murder. The two manslaughter charges are fairly straightforward. If the defendants were negligently keeping a dangerous dog, a dog that they knew was dangerous, or that they may have even helped become dangerous and that dog killed someone, then involuntary manslaughter is an appropriate charge. And pretty much everybody agreed on that. All the action in the courts, though, would be about that second-degree murder charge. So let's talk about that. Both defendants were convicted of all charges. At the conclusion of the case, defense lawyers made the standard motion for a new trial. That motion was denied as to Noel. But to the surprise of everyone, it was granted as to Noller on the second-degree murder charge. The judge stated in his opinion that he did not believe the government had met their burden in showing second-degree murder, which depended on a theory of implied malice to support it. The trial court took the position that to be guilty of that crime, Noller must have known that her conduct involved a high probability of resulting in the death of another. Finding such awareness lacking, the trial court granted Noller's motion for a new trial on the second degree murder conviction. Yeah, so basically what the trial court judge is saying is, and this is interesting that he did this. Let's think about this a little bit. So, There were probably all sorts of points when the defense moved to eliminate this charge. I could imagine a motion in limine that said, look, there's nothing you can do to prove second degree murder when it comes to a dog. You know, I mean, sure, involuntary manslaughter. You kept a dangerous dog. Maybe you trained a dog and it killed somebody. That's on you, right? But this notion that she knew the dog was was going was likely to kill someone. I mean that seems like a pretty high bar to meet. And you could even imagine the judge striking that charge in the very beginning, saying, look, just as a matter of law, there's no way you can reach that. If you think about the Derek Chauvin case, so we talked about Derek Chauvin, one of the charges, I believe it was third degree murder, was initially the judge struck that charge. And he said, look, You can't have third-degree murder because third-degree murder, the actions of the individual have to endanger more than one person. That's what the the judge had said because that's what the law was in Minnesota. And then in between when he did that and the trial, the Minnesota Supreme Court actually changed the law and said, nope, you you can have third-degree murder when there's only one person who dies. And so the charge was reinstated. And you could imagine something like that happening here where the judge is like, look, 
I just don't think there's any way you can meet the standard for this in this kind of case. So we're going to strike that. Judge doesn't do that. He lets the whole trial go forward. He lets all the evidence be put on. He lets all the witnesses testify. He lets the jury deliberate. He lets the jury find these people guilty. And then, and only then, does he make this ruling. And that's actually a, a pretty good thing that he that he did. It allowed the the evidence to be developed, the trial to happen, the trial to happen on both charges. And in that way, imagine a situation in which he had struck it for some reason. You know, then it delays the trial because it's got to go up through the appeal. You know, it, it makes things much more difficult. But here he's much more he's much more savvy. And in doing this, it allows the government to seek an appeal and say, hey, we think the judge is wrong here. And you may be wondering how they could do that. You might be thinking, is this double jeopardy? You know, the judge is saying you're not guilty of that. How can they how can the government appeal? And, you know, you might think, look, if the judge is finding that the evidence doesn't warrant a conviction, shouldn't that be it? But because the judge allowed all of this to go to the jury and because the jury found there was enough evidence to convict, then we don't have to worry about that. This becomes like a pure question of law. It can go up to the appeals court. The appeal court can decide this. And if they decide the trial judge is is wrong, all they're doing is reinstating that verdict that the jury has already reached. And it's a really smart thing that this judge did in a in a humble thing in a lot of ways. Like this judge, by doing it this way, is is sort of acknowledging that he could be wrong because he's very much allowing in a very simple, straightforward way for him himself to be overturned. He's really setting that up for the appellate court. And I feel like he's, you know, he should be praised for that. I don't know if, how much praise he gets for that, but I think I think he should. By waiting until the jury delivered its verdict, the judge can he can make his finding with the knowledge that it would be reviewed by an appellate court. If he's wrong, the court simply reinstates the jury verdict. And if he's right, then they affirm him and everybody moves on. But in this case, the appellate court did, in fact, reverse the trial judge. At that point, Noller actually appealed to the California Supreme Court. So this is a really interesting thing, right? So you had the trial. She gets convicted of this very serious offense. The trial judge overturns her conviction. The prosecution appeals to the appellate court. The appellate court says, nope, trial judge is wrong. And now it's the defendant's turn to appeal to the California Supreme Court. Now, we've talked to you guys about Supreme Courts before. Supreme Courts, they make up their own dockets. They can decide what they want to hear. They can decide what they don't want to hear. If they don't think a case is interesting or important enough or significant enough in the law, they they don't take it, even if they may think one of the lower courts is wrong. This is sort of a thing people have a tough time wrapping their heads around. When the United States Supreme Court, for instance, takes a case or doesn't take a case, they're not necessarily saying, oh, yeah, the lower court got it right, right? Like, if they don't take a case, it doesn't mean lower court got it right. And there's actually a rule that if you're making an argument to a court, you don't cite the Supreme Court's denial of a writ of certiorari, which is what you have to do to appeal to the Supreme Court, as somehow bolstering the decision of the circuit court. That's not how it works. But in this case, the Supreme Court of California thought this was such an important question that they actually did take this case, and it resulted in a very important decision clarifying what is required in a case like this where you have something called implied malice murder. So remember what the trial court thought. The trial court said, let me see if I can get it exactly right. The trial court had said that in order to show implied malice, then Noller had to, her conduct had to involve a high probability of resulting in the death of another. Right. So basically, you know, we talk about sort of depraved indifference to human life and that sort of thing. It's like if you shoot a gun into a crowd and you're not trying to kill any particular person in the crowd, But by doing that, you know there's a high probability that that bullet's going to hit somebody, and when it hits them, it's going to kill them. And that would be sort of implied malice. You don't have malice towards any particular person. It's just what you're doing is so inherently dangerous that we're going to assume there's some sort of malice in your heart because you're firing that gun into this group of people. The Supreme Court of California said, 
Okay, that's fine. But it's actually easier to meet the standard for implied malice than the trial court said. And I'll read you what they said, and then we'll try to explain it to you because you can never understand what courts say. Supreme Court concluded that, quote, malice is implied when the killing is proximately caused by the act, the natural consequence of which are dangerous to life, which act was deliberately performed by a person who knows that this conduct endangers the life of another and who acts with conscious disregard for life. To sum up, the court stated that, quote, implied malice requires a defendant's awareness of engaging in conduct that endangers the life of another. No more, no less. So that's pretty different. <laughs> very different, right? I mean, that's a much. It's more like a negligence as opposed to a because the the trial court said there had to be a knowledge factor. And I was Im- racking my brain. If she you have to show that she knows not just that there's a high probability. Essentially, the Supreme Court is saying there's no knowledge needed. There just has to be a not even a high probability, a natural consequence. What's natural consequence in terms of the spectrum of probability? It honestly seems like you just start the domino rolling and it doesn't matter how far down the domino line you are is how I read this um, explanation of their version of implied malice. Yeah, it, and it kind of, we talked about this some in the Chauvin trial where, where you interpret something in a way that it swallows up everything else. This definition, to me at least, doesn't sound that different from the manslaughter charge, mm-hmm. right? Like the manslaughter charge was basically, you know, you you were keeping a dangerous dog and you were doing it in a negligent way, a way that that allowed that dog to to get out and kill somebody, right? And you knew it was dangerous. You might have even helped it become dangerous. And then someone died. That's involuntary manslaughter. Well, what's the difference between that and this this version of second degree murder. I mean, I'll read you again. Implied malice requires a defendant's awareness of engaging in conduct that endangers the life of another, no more and no less. I mean, that so, really sounds like shooting into a, a crowded theater, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, you know, keeping a dog you know is dangerous. Like, if right. you keep a dog that you know is dangerous, then isn't that engaging in conduct that endangers the life of another? Especially if it's a big dog. A dog that you know, if it went crazy, you could kill somebody. Right. What what is the distinction there between the involuntary or the voluntary manslaughter and this? I don't know. To me, I think the trial court had a better part of the argument. And here here is, you know, going back to what you said, giving a lot of credit to the trial judge, because I think the trial judge knew how he was going to rule at the end, but he let the trial go forward. We have always said, you know, bad facts make bad law. Right. And here. um here you have just horrendous facts about how um, Diane was mauled to death by a dog, maybe two dogs. And the Supreme Court, really, even though they were just dealing with the legal issue, had the entire factual record before them in order to marry up their kind of pie-in-the-sky legal definition to facts on the ground. And that's what they did here, because in reaching its decision, the California Supreme Court walked through the evidence that demonstrated that Noller should have known that her conduct, keeping these particular dogs in close quarters with others, was dangerous. This is also the evidence the jury heard. The Supreme Court noted that Hera and Bain had broken out of a fenced yard and killed a sheep before the two lawyers even owned them. And when the couple took the dogs on their initial vet visit, he told them that the dogs would be a liability in any household and recounted to them other stories in which similar dogs had seriously injured others. The website for the Dogs of War breeding operation had a picture of Bain with the caption, bringer of death i have to stop there real quick that's a lot of evidence by the way um yeah and and frankly i actually think that this evidence presented at trial even fulfills what the trial judge thought was the definition of implied malice but i'm you know i i don't know what do you think do you think this is enough well, I mean, there's more. <laughs> no, there is more. That, that's fair. That, I'm, and I'm stopping right there as a teaser to say I, I already think that pretty much gets you there. But And, I, yeah, and I, I, yeah. I bring this up because I think that 
perhaps the legal definition was swayed by the overwhelming evidence. Because I, I guess my problem with the legal definition, I think you're right. I think what you said is right. So you said that the evidence here is enough to meet the standard the trial judge laid out, right? Right. And I think you're right about that. And I think the mistake the Supreme Court of California made was they didn't have to change the legal standard. They could have they could have left that legal standard, which I think is a clear standard and fits better with sort of a differentiation between these these levels of murder and just applied these facts to that standard. And I think they would have reached the same conclusion. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I agree with that. And that. Like you said, there's more. Between September 2000 and the fatal mauling in January 2001, there was at least 30 incidents in which the dogs were out of control and threatened either people or other animals in the apartment complex. Side note, I can't believe this apartment complex let them have these two dogs, by the way. <laughs> like, man, I, I can barely no. get like a turtle, you know, in my pet This claws. is San Francisco. This I isn't know. exactly a hands-off jurisdiction. No kidding. But, okay, several of these incidents involved the dogs actually biting people or animals. In fact, the dogs had bitten Whipple before. Letters the couple wrote to Schneider in prison were frankly celebratory of their inability to control the dogs. They wrote of the dogs breaking away from them in the hallway, quote, took off side by side down the hall toward the elevator in a celebratory stampede. 240 pounds of presa, wall to wall, moving at top speed with three exclamation points. I mean, this is like celebrating their power and their inability to control them. Not saying, hey, these dogs you bred, they're a real liability for us. We're lawyers, we know. And can yeah. we also talk about how lawyers <laughs> acted in this manner, knowing kind of the liability this would bring upon them? I know, it's it's crazy. It's like, like you said earlier, these lawyers that we're talking about here were not generally thought to be, you know, bad people, right? I mean, they come off when you read these stories as just terrible people who have these awful dogs who did these terrible things and they're aligned with this Aryan Brotherhood guy. But then you read about their actual law practice and they were, you know, they were doing a lot of pro bono work and they were representing prisoners and they were, you know, representing the homeless and doing civil rights work. And I just don't understand. It's like they became so enamored with, with these dogs and with, you know, their crazy stepson that they allowed themselves to completely lose any kind of perspective. And you, you know, if you ever watched, we talk about, you know, <laughs> reckless disregard for human life. If you ever watched the original Law and Order, basically everybody got charged with second degree murder in that show. And it was always, you know, reckless disregard for human life because that, that makes it a lot more interesting than if it's just you shoot somebody because what does that mean? And it's all very confusing. And Jack gets to be really persuasive in his closing argument. This to me is the perfect example of this where these people, had these dogs that were so dangerous and they were trained to be dangerous and they knew they could not control them and they reveled in that fact and then someone died because of it. To me, it's like the perfect example of that, which is why I still think the, the Supreme Court of California, well, I think they got to the right result. I think their reasoning was flawed and probably did some damage to the law there. And look, well, we've already given you a lot of reasons to think these people had a reckless disregard for human life, but we're still not even done. They refused to use a choke collar on these dogs, which, you know, a lot of people don't like choke collars, and I get that, and I think you should only probably use them in extreme situations. This was an extreme situation. Worse than that, they refused to even muzzle these dogs, to even put a muzzle on them. That the dogs ripped off Whipple's clothes, we talked about before, is actually also consistent with something called rag training, which is used to make dogs more aggressive. And police recovered a book called Man Stopper! Exclamation point, from the couple's apartment, which is a book that teaches owners how to train dogs to be more aggressive. So it's pretty clear here that not only could these people not control these dogs, but they were making them even worse. And the Supreme Court summed it up. The immediate cause of Whipple's death 
was Noller's own conscious decision to take the dog Bane unmuzzled through the apartment building where they were likely to encounter other people knowing that Bane was aggressive and highly dangerous and that she could not control them. And I think that is a, a hundred percent correct. Brett, before we move on, I have to tell you, I am so excited about our sponsor, Audible. Forget about last summer. It's all about this summer. We've all been inside long enough. So grab some beach towels, stock the cooler, and make your escape. It's time to celebrate the best season of the year like never before. With so many great stories and programs, Audible is the perfect summer partner. And now is the absolute best time to do it because Prime members can save 53% off your first four months. With Audible, you can listen to more of whatever you're into because Audible has it all. An unbeatable selection of audiobooks, tons of binge-worthy podcasts, and exclusive originals all available to download or stream. Here's what you get. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month like the latest bestseller or hottest new release. Yours to keep for Ever. And here's the best part. You also get full access to Audible's streaming library, the Plus Catalog. Right now, for a limited time, Amazon Prime members can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only $6.95 a month. Get more out of summer with Audible. Take advantage of this incredible limited time offer. Go to audible.com slash TP. That's audible.com slash TP. And come see what Brett and I love so much about Audible. So in the end, Noel received four years in prison for manslaughter, while Noler received 15 years to life. Noelle died in 2018 while Noller is still in prison. She was denied parole in 2019. She'll be up again in 2022. So next year we will keep track of this case and let you know exactly, exactly what happens with her if she stays in jail or if she is released. An interesting sort of coda to this case, it's uh, Sharon Smith, who was Whipple's domestic partner, actually successfully sued the couple for damages, which probably doesn't seem surprising to you given that her partner was killed because of these dogs. But at the time, there actually was a pretty good standing argument. And standing, you have to show that you have standing to sue someone. And if you don't have standing, you can't sue. So if you think about it, like, um, I can't sue on Brett's behalf if um, someone hits him with a car. Because I don't have standing. I'm not the injured party. Brett can sue the driver of the car, but I can't sue the driver of the car. Exactly. Exactly. Now, my wife could sue if I was struck by a vehicle because she has standing. And at the time, as you may recall, at the time, there was no such thing as gay marriage. And the argument was made by Noler and Noel that they had no standing because she was only the domestic partner. And the Supreme Court of California rejected that position and decided for the first time that same-sex couples have standing to file lawsuits due to conduct resulting in the death of one of the partners. Sharon ended up donating a portion of the $1.5 million award she received to the St. Mary's lacrosse team where Diane was the coach in her memory. So that's the one small bright spot in this otherwise very dark story. Whew. I mean, this is, it's just fascinating on so many, so many level, levels. And in this case, we didn't even walk through all of the trial uh, because there was so much um, on the appeal that was fascinating. But I mean, what do you think, Brett? Do you think that, let's start with Noel. He wasn't even there, right? He wasn't, uh, he didn't walk the dogs down the apartment uh, hallway where Diane was ultimately attacked and killed. He wasn't even in the vicinity and he gets four years for manslaughter. Do you think that was the correct legal decision? I do. And he, he actually made that argument. He made that argument that because he wasn't there, he shouldn't have any responsibility for this. 
But the fact of the matter is, that's why the charging decision was made that was made. He wasn't charged with second degree murder. He was still charged with the manslaughter charge. And I think that's the correct charge. Just walking through some of that evidence, he participated in laying the foundation that led to this, right? I mean, he was, he knew the dog couldn't be controlled. He knew his wife couldn't control it. He would have known about the training the dog was undergoing. He knew, he knew about the dog biting people. There was testimony that one person told him, uh, your dog bit me. And his response was, oh, that's interesting. Like, so he, he just, he also just didn't care that, that this situation was ongoing. And I do think it was the correct decision. And I think it was also the correct decision for Noller to get a much higher sentence. Now, look, these are some pretty stiff sentences. Four years for manslaughter is not that stiff, right? Um, I mean, that seems about right. But 15 years to life for Noller. That's a, that's a pretty stiff sentence. I mean, that's more of a sentence than a lot of people get, frankly, for different kinds of, of murder. But I do think it was appropriate. I think. I think at the end of the day, these people knew what they were doing and they knew that that this was dangerous. And they were, once again, they were breeding, not only breeding, they raised these dogs to be dangerous. They raised these dogs to be violent and vicious. And they're the reason the dogs were the way they were. It's like Alice said before, these dogs can be wonderful animals, loving, caring, yes, protective, but gentle Apprises actually are, are somewhat known to be, you know, you have to have the appropriate training for them, but they're actually great family dogs. You know, they're protective, and so they're great with little children because they're kind of like German shepherds. They're good at kind of herding the little little children, and they won't let strangers come near you, and that's a good thing, but they're very loving to their families. Hence, you know, we have Noler and Noel here. Um, but they, you're right. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were reading books on how to make these dogs more aggressive. And these were sophisticated people. I know, you know, I don't want that to be brought in any trial against me if I'm, you know, violate the law somehow that because I'm a lawyer, but it will be. I should have known better. But it will be. But that's the point here. This is not just some person who has no education, you, you know, living on, say, a dog breeding farm in the middle of nowhere who's never been to – um a formal education and known what dogs are capable of doing. These are f- sophisticated professionals whose job really is about liability and is about um, violations of the law. And here they are um, creating a liability. They didn't just take in this dog. This is not just like some um, uh, poor, abused animal shelter adopting of dogs, right? I know because a lot of you are probably a little nervous as you're listening to this. You're thinking, geez, if I take in a former dog fighting dog, you know, from the shelter, am I putting myself in the same situation? Think about the facts here. These are not just adopted dogs off the street who um, were thrown on the streets because they were dangerous. They bred them and then took steps to make them even more vicious um, each each passing day with their training. Right. That's And that's 100% right. And, you know, they also weren't people living off on a farm where, you know, an unfortunate traveling salesman came by and got eaten by their dogs. They lived in an apartment building in the middle of the city. Everything they did set up a situation in which these dogs would seriously harm someone. I mean, that's another thing, I think, sort of a subtext. And I don't know if the Supreme Court ever brings this out, but this was inevitable. This was going to happen. Maybe not someone was going to be killed, but someone was going to be seriously injured by these dogs. And it was only a matter of time. And they should have known that. And because they didn't do anything to prevent it, at the end of the day, they were responsible. So yes, I do think it was a fair decision. I mean, this is a a fascinating case. You guys should really go read those articles we'll link to on our website. And thank you again for uh, Twitter World for suggesting this doc. I'd never heard of it. And it's such an interesting case, um, both factually and legally. Yeah. And I hope you guys, I hope we did you, I hope we did this case justice. So let us know. Um, I don't, at my fingertips, I don't have the person who, who suggested this, but reach out and let us know if we answered your questions. And if we didn't, we will answer them later. All right. Well, if you're only here for the true crime, you can go ahead and, and, and turn it off now and, and see us next week. But yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting few weeks, Alice, as I think a lot of folks 
know by now, but you know, as I as I had talked about earlier, my wife uh, was expecting a child. It's actually due on July fourth was the due date, and we knew we would never make it to July fourth, but nevertheless, that was kind of cool. Um, and everything was rocking along. Alice and I, we we went several hours away to interview some witnesses, spent the night together in a hotel. It was nowhere near as fun as that sounds. Um, and then the next You can't day, leave it like that, Brett. <laughs> People are going to go wild with that. We stayed in the separate Roof rooms in, totally at a hotel. Different. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to, I don't know, create more clicks. Clickbait. Sorry, That's sorry. totally clickbait. That was totally clickbait. Yeah. <laughs> totally different. Separate floors, as a matter of fact. It's true. Uh, anyway, so Alice and I were several hours away. And my wife had a routine checkup, as as you have often. You guys who've been pregnant know you're going to the doctor all the time. And Alice and I had finished up our first set of interviews, and I get a text from my wife, and it just says, call me. And you know, when you get that text, that's not good, right? Like something something is not good. And when I called my wife, she's like, hey, they're admitting me to the hospital. They want to do some tests, which also wasn't good. At which point, Alice, being the amazing person that she is, drives me back home so that, because I didn't have a car, because I had ridden with her, drives me back home so that I can get to the hospital. Our agents wanted to go lights and sirens the whole way, but I think that's just because that's what, that's what police like to do. But we didn't do that. We just you know drove the normal way, and I'm freaking out the whole way, and Alice is keeping me calm, because that's what Alice does. She keeps me calm. I'm really not. And I was asking him very anxiety-producing questions. <laughs> That's not true. You were you were definitely keeping me calm. I was feeling much calmer because of Alice and her wonderfulness. But to make a long story short, in the course of, you know, 24 hours, we went from everything's on track, we're having a very sort of normal pregnancy to, you know, a doctor telling us that we had a 50% chance basically of our baby surviving. And when you get news like that, that's obviously, I mean, that's a blow, right? I mean, you guys, a lot of you guys have been through things like this. And I mean, I, I, I held up as well as I could. But fortunately, the doctors here in town realized that they were not capable of dealing with this kind of situation that we were in. And they sent us to UAB, which is in Birmingham, Alabama, which has one of the best neonatal units in the country they're amazing they're terrific if you guys are facing anything like this uab is a place to go and we went there and spent a couple days there before they decided it was you know it was go time we were doing an emergency c-section um at 34 weeks which is early but not not you know not terribly early and it was never really the earliness that was the problem the baby had some underlying health issues that it just wasn't clear what was going to happen. And I mean, yeah, sitting in that waiting room, waiting for the C-section to start, I just remember thinking, there's just some point where I was like, God, I can't do this. Like, you just got to handle it. Like, I, <laughs> I can't, you know, I can, this is just something I can't fix or even really comprehend. So just kind of putting it in your hands. And we went back there and we did the C-section and you had that five minutes after the, you know, the, the baby's born. and there's no, you know, there's no crying. There's nothing like that. And it's just them rushing the baby out of the room and us sitting there wondering, like, what's going to happen when they come back in here? You know, like, this is the five minutes that's going to determine sort of the rest of our lives. And, you know, praise be to God and, and thank you to all y'all who were praying. They were able to stabilize the baby, get the baby to the um, NICU where... For the last week, they've been doing a lot of work with him, and I am very happy to say that he's doing a lot better. I mean, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, and we got a long way to go, and he's got a long way to go. And those of you who've been thinking about us and praying for us, I hope you will continue to do that. And I just got to tell you, like, it made all the difference in the world. And the messages you guys, I mean, there are so many people who who reached out to us and I'm going to mention a few by name but you know if I don't mention you don't don't take that as a slight because there were so many people Shannon who's one of our fans from Washington sent me all sorts of information I mean information's so great right because the worst part's when you just don't know 
and you have no idea what you're doing. And Shannon had some experience with this and she sent me some stuff that made me feel a lot better. Tim from Tim and Lance reached out. He had no idea what was going on. He just knew I wasn't talking on Twitter, which is so weird for me. <laughs> so, so he noticed that and like reached out to make sure I was okay. Um, and I really appreciate that. And you guys on Patreon, I mean, I just, I don't even know what to say about you guys. So the day this was all happening at the end of May and like the day before June 1st, I was thinking about the fact that June 1st is when everybody's credit cards get charged. And I didn't know if we were going to have any stuff in June. And, you know, I mean, you all's money is precious. And the fact that you choose to give any of it to us is amazing. And we still can't believe you do it. And the last thing I wanted was, you know, to take your money when I'm not giving you anything in return. So I sent a message to everybody. I was like, hey, my life's crazy. I don't know what's going to happen. We have this issue with the baby. Feel free to, you know, reduce your or cancel your subscription and we'll be back later. Right. And <laughs> and and nobody did that. In fact, most people there were <laughs> nobody. Nobody did that. And there were people who actually increased their contributions. And we got like dozens of emails from people about how they were thinking about us and they were praying for us. And it was just, I mean, it was overwhelming. And I can't thank you guys enough. And that's why I wanted to talk about this on an episode because, you know, I can send you emails or whatever, but I feel like hearing it from me hopefully means more to you or you guys hear exactly how much it meant to me and my family because it meant the world and you know <clears throat> not to get all religious on you guys but you know the bible talks about how god and jesus act through people that a lot of times you know you may be ministering to angels unaware like that that whole idea and i just feel like you guys were angels I mean, you were you were doing the lord's work for me I mean, you made all the difference and it was incredible. And, and, and when there were times where I just thought, I just don't know about this, you know, reading those, reading those emails, Alice went to crime con and a lot of you sent videos. I mean, it was just, it was awesome. It was awesome. And I just wanted to thank you all personally from the bottom of my heart. Like I said, we're, you're not out of the woods and we are still fighting through this, but if we get through it, it's going to be because of you guys. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you to Alice, who is amazing and wonderful, and it is difficult, it is difficult to really express how much Alice means to me and means to my family, and I mean it when I say that we love you, and we love your family, and your family is our family. Brett, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm along with everyone who's listening, you know, crying right now. But I just want to say thank you for updating all of us because I can't imagine the strength it takes to talk about this when you are still in the midst of the fire. So, you know, we are all still thinking about you. I read every one of y'all's messages on Patreon, and not only did you guys increase your um, contributions, um, I had recorded, you know, a, a quick little segment uh, in front of uh, the first bonus baby episode that was a non-substantive episode telling you guys the situation. And I did not go into any detail at that point because we didn't know anything at that detail. All I said was that baby's early, you know, and that was it. And you guys flooded. Um, I, I think we got more Patreon um, new subscriptions from that little shout out to, you know, new new baby boy. And you just can't imagine. And that was after we said there are no additional new episodes, you know, <laughs> like this is it. <laughs> we don't know when we're going to start recording again. So, Brett, just know that people love you um, because they've gotten to know you over, I don't know, 100 or so episodes, um, almost 100 episodes in a year of you talking. And um, we are all still praying for you. And it's not going to end. We know this is a long road. And this is kind of the beginning, but we're with you the whole way. And I think I speak for all our fans when I say in the midst of your first week of just life altering trauma, you're sitting here recording. So thank you for caring about, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of all your fans. Thank you for caring enough about them to want to come back and, and record with us. Well, you know, we talk about the true crime community a lot and it's not just words. Um, you guys taught me that 
I always believed it, but you guys confirmed it for me over this last week or so. So I will keep giving you guys updates. Um, if you've been sending emails or Twitter messages, sorry if I haven't responded. Obviously, not been not been that active. So you might want to send them again if you had like a really good thought. <laughs> and I mean about like actual, you know, like a case suggestion or something like that. Um, I read every one of your your emails about this situation, but. Yeah, love you guys. Thank you so much. Not going to dwell on this. I know you guys have places to go and, and people to see. But, yeah, just wanted to say thank you. Um, Like I said, this is a marathon, not a sprint. My wife and I are trying to get sort of into a regular rhythm with all this. So, you know, hopefully as far as the show goes, I realize the show is not the most important thing. But we'll be back to to putting out episodes on a fairly regular schedule. And if for some reason we don't, we're not able to do that, we will we will let you know. But our intention is that next week we will be back with a a new case that will not be new to those of you who are on Patreon because you've already you already have all three episodes. But we have a three parter, three week series coming up on a case that many of you have wanted to hear our thoughts about, and we are going to to give those to you. But Alice, do you have anything else you want to add before we sign off for today? No, just thank you to the greatest fans of all time. Thank you for coming up to our booth at CrimeCon. Thank you for supporting us through through life. Um, we, we just appreciate you guys. Yeah, it's been an interesting you know year and a couple months. We've, <laughs> we, we've all been through a lot together. So let's just let's keep on. Helping each other get through it. That's life, right? It's like that. It's like was the beginning of that Prince song. We're all gathered here together. Get through this crazy thing called life. So that's what we're doing. Um, All right. Well, we will be back next week with a new case. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutor. I missed you so much. I really, I really miss you guys. Like, <laughs> I gotta tell you. So during this driving back and forth stuff, yeah, we started listening to Big Mad True Crime, and it's like so good. Big, big <laughs> like, mad know. true crime. Big mad true crime. Really good. Like it's it's quickly becoming one of my top, and it's different. They're all like cases I've never heard of. Wow. It's, it's neat. That's awesome. It's really, she's okay. really good. And she's like, she takes, she's, she's very matter of fact. And there's, she's just like, this person sucks. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>